Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. I'm editor-at-large at America Media and a Jesuit priest, and I'm happy to welcome you to this web series, Deacons, Women, and the Call to Serve. It's sponsored by Fordham Center on Religion and Culture and America Media. The current Vatican Commission uh, that is exploring the possibility of women deacons has raised a number of questions about the role of deacons. As ordained ministers who are neither priests nor lay people, their actual role in parishes where they minister remains somewhat unclear to many Catholics. So this web series is going to look at a few questions with some really terrific experts. What are deacons? How has their role changed over history? Could women deacons revolutionize pastoral ministry and even transform the church? How can the diaconate better meet the changing needs of the faithful today? So I'm very happy to be with four distinguished panelists. Nancy Della Valle, who is a theologian and vice president for mission and identity at Fairfield University in Connecticut. Deacon Greg Kandra, who's a blogger at Alatea's The Deacon's Bench and multimedia editor at Kanewa, which is the Catholic Near East Welfare Association. Rita Ferrone is contributing editor at Commonweal Magazine and a blogger at Pray Tell. George Dimacopoulos is a theologian and co-director at the Fordham Orthodox Christian Studies Center. So the first question is an easy one, or maybe not, uh, and I'm going to uh, turn it to uh, Deacon Greg Kandra. Uh, what are deacons, Greg? Glad you asked. <laughs> Well, a lot of people don't realize that there are three levels of holy orders in the Catholic Church, uh, priest, or b deacon, priest, and bishop. The deacon is the lowest level of holy orders, and the deacon is ordained really to serve as a minister of the word. He proclaims the gospel at mass. He also preaches at mass. Uh, minister of the sacrament, he witnesses marriages and does baptisms and uh, occasionally presides uh, at other functions. And he is a minister of charity. And in the early days of the church, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear about men being ordained as deacons to help distribute uh, temporal goods to widows and orphans and to care for for people who are, are challenged in those ways, and the deacon continues that today in the church. And what is the, uh, the history of the diaconate? How did it come to be? And maybe someone can trace it through uh, 2,000 years of church history in, uh, in a few minutes. <laughs> who would like to? <laughs> well, I'd like to just make an observation <laughs> sure. to piggyback on what Greg has said, and that is that uh, we've always had deacons in the church, but one of the things that's very significant to this whole discussion is that after Vatican II, it was decided to restore the permanent diaconate, because being a deacon was always a stepping stone. It wasn't always a stepping stone. It was, pardon me, in our more recent history, in several centuries preceding Vatican II, it had become a part of a cursus honorum, that you went through these different stages before you were ordained a priest. So we had deacons, but they were always transitional deacons, as we would call them now. And what's new today is that we have not only transitional deacons, but permanent deacons. And, and this is really related to a, a bigger question, which is diaconia, or the charism of service, which is given to people by their baptism. But in the, uh, uh, in the realm of holy orders, the diaconate has a special place, which, as you've described it so well, uh, encompasses service and the word in a special way. Uh, so the imaging of Christ as servant is always to be present to the church. Uh, but it is now the case that we have a new situation on the ground uh, for us in terms of our recent history. So there's this restoration of the permanent diaconate after the Second Vatican Council. What about beforehand? What, what, was the, what was the history of deacons? What was the role of deacons beforehand? How did they get started? And what were they doing up until the Second Vatican Council? Yeah, so um, in, in the early church, um, whether you're talking about uh, Christian East or Christian West, you really did have a, um, a permanent diaconate. Um, the deacons uh, in the biblical period were very much in charge of service, but once the church became more institutionalized after the reign of Constantine where Christianity was legalized, deacons of a, of a variety of forms took on a whole host of administrative roles within the church. Uh, they served as secretaries, they served as property managers, um, what have you. In fact, there was a period of time for about 200 years 
uh, in the city of Rome, so from approximately the year 400 until the year 600, where you had a very sharp dividing line between the order of priests and the order of deacons. And the election of a pope for that 200-year period typically alternated between the senior most deacon and the senior most priest. And you had a kind of rivalry between the two classes in the ordination. Um, and so deacons uh, became, were, uh, they, had, they had an enormous amount of influence in the church. They, they helped to set policy. They would preach on behalf of the bishop or the pope, what have you. And they had, historically, they controlled the administration of the church as well as its philanthropic arm. So Greg was talking about uh, the liturgical uh, roles of the deacons, but you're saying that they also were administrators? Were the priests administrators at the time uh, as well? Was there a kind of conflict in that much, sense? No, much less so. Um, the, uh, typically what would happen at the time, at the time a man, we'll get to the women in a minute, but when a man was elected to the diaconate, or, um, or ordained to the diaconate, there would be some kind of decision made. Was this person going to be on the administrative track or was this person going to be on the priestly track? If he was going to be on the priestly track, then the ordination to the diaconate would be very short-lived, and he would immediately go over to the priestly track, and at which point he would have a primarily pastoral and liturgical role. If he was going to be on the permanent diaconate route, then he would be an administrator of sorts, whether it was the church's philanthropy um, or its administration. What are the earliest uh, roots of the diaconate? How early do we see that in the church? Well, we see it in scripture, and one of the things is that women are part of this story from the beginning. We have Phoebe in the letter to the Romans. What I think is interesting, though, about what you're saying, George, is that the ministry of the deacon is all over the place in the early church, and it's not because it's confused, it's simply because there are a number of offices that people are trying to fulfill, there are a number of things that need to be done, and what we see with these very scattered references to women in the early church is that sometimes these are widows, sometimes these are holy women, sometimes these are actually women deacons, but they're doing a variety of jobs, and it's not a very well-developed movement. So when we turn to look at the past for this, and we're saying, were there women deacons? The answer is, yes, there were, but exactly what were they? What did they do? How did they function? And more importantly to my eyes is, how were they received in the early church? Now, who could describe for me, um, if, you, if you asked, uh, uh, a Christian at the time, a Catholic uh, later on, what a deacon does, say, in the early church, in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance. I mean, did, did their roles change significantly? Uh, were, there, were there stages in the development of what a deacon would do? Because certainly the way that uh, Nancy uh, and George are describing the diaconate, the administrators and liturgical functions is not the way that we think of them later on. Can someone describe how those roles changed? Well, part of it that gets very complicated for us to look back is that we can't really consider what the deacon does without realizing that the role of bishop has changed dramatically in between. So in the early church, you would have had bishops doing many of the things that a pastor of a large parish would do today. All the sacraments of initiation, all of the things having to do with the administration of the local church. The local bishop was like the premier, premier pastor. And so deacons, being related to the bishop, didn't mean that they were going around in the diocesan ministry with, you know, a hundred parishes. It meant that they were actually hands-on, working closely together with the bishop who was pastoring people. And then in the Middle Ages, the diaconate starts to be subsumed into a much more subdued role in the church because it is, uh, uh, the priesthood has become that much more important and the bishop is a distant character who shows up for confirmation or ordination. So that changes. Then you institutionalize our th sacramental theology in the Middle Ages with uh, defining the seven sacraments at a time far distant from the founding of some of these uh, orders in the clergy. And so what you get is sometimes an institutionalized definition of, well, holy orders is this, because that was what they knew at the time in the 13th century when they were making up these handbooks and uh, uh, making some determinations about boundaries and especially some of the determinations about what women can and can't do, to follow up on your point, Nancy. And so uh, then we come to today, 
we have a very different uh, framework. We have more knowledge of history, but in some ways we're also trying to keep continuity with the past. So that gives us a situation where, well, what is a deacon today? In a way, it can't look the same as it looked in uh, at the time of St. John Chrysostom, much less how it looked, uh, you know, for Duns Scotus. So uh, but it helps to see it. They don't look the same today because the church is not the same today. Sometimes we act as if the church today has been simply the same throughout the century, and that's not true. And so there's a way in which it's really important that we do our historical spade work on this question, but there's going to be no sort of honest broker who stands between us and the past and says, here's what happened, what happened, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do, because we are a historically normative tradition. We are a living tradition, and we, we appropriate inhabit this tradition. And what you had to say about uh, the relationship to the bishop is, is key because I've heard it described that uh, the, the priest and the deacon are like the two arms of the bishop. And even now, the deacon is considered to be the eyes and ears of the bishop in the local parish. He's supposed to be in touch with the needs and concerns of the people and be able to try and meet those needs and address those needs to the bishop whenever possible. So the, the role of uh, deacon has uh, changed throughout church history as has the role of the priest and the bishop. Um, what happens to the permanent diaconate? Where does that go? Does that get suppressed or does it just sort of fall away? Uh, and when does that happen? So, so in, the, in the Orthodox Church, um, it, it, never, it never went away. Um, it certainly diminished. Um, what's happened in the Orthodox Church is uh, throughout the Middle Ages, you, you certainly had a permanent diaconate that was, that was so large, actually, that the Roman Emperor Justinian capped the number of deacons assigned to the Church of Hagia Sophia at 150, wow. right? Because they were paid from the imperial treasury and he was tired of paying for them. Um, so, so, so you had a huge institution, and, and in the modern world what's happened is you have, you, you have retained a permanent diaconate, um, but only um, a very small one. So an archbishop, right, might have two deacons who are career deacons, um, or who might become priests at the time um, the, arch, the archbishop resigns or passes away or what have you. But th there'll be a 20 or 30 year lifespan uh, in the diaconate, um, or a patriarch, or what have you. Um, you no longer have an office staff of 50 permanent deacons. You have an office staff or two or three. Um, uh, so, so, you, so you've never lost it entirely in the, in the Eastern Church, but it has certainly diminished uh, from, from the Middle Ages. In the West, though, um, you know, the Latin Rite and the Catholic Church, what happened to the, the diaconate that, that, that made it uh, sort of become a transitional role. Where did where, what happened to to make it uh, less of a permanent uh, function? Uh, it seems to me that there was an abundance of clergy in the Middle Ages, and that they were trying to organize things in such a way that it was going to work better for them in their particular situation. And so the uh, transition transitional di diaconate it, it was in the Middle Ages that the permanent diaconate really died out. Um, the disappearance of a permanent diaconate is also tied to the changing role of the church vis-a-vis -vis the state, right? So in, in the early Middle Ages, when the state in many places was the church, right, you needed administrators, right? You needed lifelong servants who were committed to the project, right? Um, and as the church's relationship to the state, particularly in terms of providing social services, diminished with the rise of the nation state, so too did you, so too did you, you simply no longer needed the same number of bodies. You, you still needed the sacraments, right? Um, but, but you no longer needed um, the bodies to run an institution that was simply no longer as large. Let's look at the, um, the restoration um, of the diaconate um, in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, the early 1960s. Um, what happened to, uh, to sort of bring that to light? Were there, were there sort of arguments for that earlier, or did it sort of come upon the, the council sort of, you know, as a Yeah, surprise? the interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize is that there, was, there were discussions going all the way back to the 19th century about restoring the diaconate as a permanent and full and separate order. And it really caught fire uh, in, uh, during World War II in, uh, in one of the camps at Dachau. Uh, de priester block where the priests had been cloistered and they started having discussions amongst themselves about how to rebuild the world after World War II. 
And one of the ideas that, that they proposed and that they talked about was bringing back deacons who would live in the community and be responsive to the needs of the people in the community and be almost like worker priests. And in the 1950s, um, someone who had uh, been in the camp approached, uh, a priest who had then become a bishop, approached uh, Pope Pius with this idea. And his response was very telling. He said, it's not time yet. And he wanted them to think about this a little bit more. And lo and behold, the Second Vatican Council came along you know, many years later. And these guys who had been in the camps, where many of them had become bishops and leaders in the church. And so they brought this forward. And here we are today. And how was it, uh, how was it received? I mean, because for a lot of Catholics, uh, this would have been a new thing. I mean, if they, they, even if they didn't sort of fully appreciate the, the role before, it would have been something that was a surprise. But I think it was of a piece with the liturgical sensibility that came out of the Second Vatican Council. And so in some ways, I think it made sense to people in terms of the full act of conscious participation of the laity. So they saw that as sort of as an extension of that into this, into the clergy. And I think so in some ways, I think they accepted it fairly well. People, people saw many things changing, so there was an openness. I can speak to the liturgical side of this a little bit because uh, the emphasis that was placed on having a variety of ministries in the Constitution on the sacred liturgy, this was actually quite new. I mean, it used to be that the priest had to perform or co-perform every action of the Mass for validity. And now to say both that lay people and that these different ministries had an, an office in their own right, that was really firmly put forward at Vatican II. And I think it made a lot of sense to people that it was not simply a delegated aspect of the priest, but that there were differences of ministry and that it all contributes to a sense that we are doing this together. And celebration of the liturgy isn't just a function of the priest and then maybe some of us help the priest, but that each different role has an integrity and that it's in uh, the kind of symphonic connection of those things that you begin to see the beauty of the people of God gathered uh, in all their array. So it's been more than 50 years since uh, Vatican II. How has it been received by people? Is it something that is uh, part of the uh, lived life of Catholics, uh, at least in the West? I think it's been received better by the people than by some of the clergy in the hierarchy. Uh, there are still some places that are resistant to it for one reason or another. Um, but I think the people welcome the participation of deacons. I think they like having someone, many of, many of us are married and have families, they like hearing that perspective and that point of view from the pulpit. They feel that we are somehow more relatable in many ways. We live among them, we work among them, they see us on the street all the time. But I think in that there really lies a conundrum. I, I, I think this is a problem in the church actually because we have accepted deacons with a deficient understanding of what and who they are. And that in some people's mind it's lovely because they're like junior priests or mini priests, or the surrogate priest, when father can't come, the deacon does it. And this is a problem, uh, because it's not a mature understanding of what the diaconate is, and it leads to complications, too, when we uh, try to really understand this uh, on its own two feet. One of the biggest misunderstandings people have, I think, is this impression that we have deacons because we don't have enough priests. Yeah. And it's not that way at all. And Especially when you have a married diaconate and the yeah. celibate priesthood, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that, that, that just presumption sort of invites itself. And you also, there are some bishops who have this impression yeah. that they have enough priestly vocations, we don't need deacons, mm -hmm. uh, which is a whole other problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, again, uh, they don't understand the nature of the vocation and, mm -hmm. and what we're about. Is it different with the Orthodox Church because you have married clergy and married deacons? Um, so we really, um, uh, okay, so it, 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 is, it certainly is different um, in the sense that we do have married clergy and the vast majority of our priests are, are married, right? So, so the way it works in the Orthodox Church, a deacon or a priest can be married so long as they're married before the ordination to the diaconate. Bishops are selected from the celibate, fr from the celibate clergy. Um, I think some of the warm receptivity that you have for the diaconate, I think, could be a kind of pastoral thing where people um, feel a certain com uh, shared 
livelihood uh, with, with a married diaconate. And, and so in the Orthodox Church, um, we do have that sort of pastoral uh, opportunity, uh, if, if, if you want to call it that. Um, we do not really have um, a very active diaconate. Um, so it, it's certainly there, um, but we don't really have an active one. In, in the Greek Orthodox Church in the United States, they did start a program about 10 years ago um, of a lay diaconate, right? Um, so the church, typical parishes don't have the resources to employ somebody full time who isn't a priest. Um, so they allowed, they allowed men to do a certain amount of training, maintain their jobs in the world, so to speak, um, but then take on a kind of uh, diaconal role. And, and the ones that I've met that have done this, I think they're absolutely perfect. It, it, it's, going, it's going really well, but it's a kind of slow step. Nancy, how do you think the diaconate has been received and understood by the Catholic faithful? I think it's I think it's been received quite well. I think they really do function in the way that you described. They sort of they are sort of a more outgoing, more relatable uh, aspect of the clergy. Um, one thing that I think is important to keep in mind, though, is just they serve the bishop. And when we thought when we start thinking about uh, women deacons, we, the idea is a very open. Oh wow, let's let's consider having women deacons. And when you consider that deacons really are directly related to the bishop. You are there in service of the bishop. And so it's a very specific role. And so I wonder if it's going to seem the same. We'll get into this later, I know. But I wonder if it's going to seem the same for the women who might be inclined to do that. Because the, the deacons that I've seen just r relate very well. They're, they're comfortable. They have their own livelihood. People are sort of aware that they're volunteers in that sense, that they're not being paid. And I think that that works pretty well. One of the interesting details about the, the ordination rite that's different from an ordination for a priest is that when deacons are ordained, the bishop lays hands on them mm -hmm. uh, when you're ordained as a deacon, and that's it. When you're ordained as a priest, other priests also lay hands on you, and that emphasizes and underscores yeah. the direct relationship that the deacon has only to the bishop. Right. And it's, it's a relationship of obedience, yes? That's, ex that's the other thing that I think a, a lot of people haven't quite wrapped their arms around, right. is that today, when, so. when you uh, are ordained, you do make a promise of obedience to a bishop. Yes. I think it's also worth noticing that there are many different dioceses that have different degrees of investment in the restoration of the diaconate. Some dioceses have a lot of deacons. Others have uh, curtailed the number of deacons because they don't feel there's the need or they have some sort of... Uh, so there's obviously, it's been received where it has been done. But I think it's worth noting that it hasn't been done everywhere. And one of the things that came to my attention through the statement on diaconate from the International Theological Commission is that worldwide that's also the case. And some countries have, who were thought that, that it was thought that they would be very interested in the diaconate in, uh, for example, some of the uh, uh, global south uh, did not take advantage of it as much as people in the first world or more prosperous uh, lands. So it's uh, uneven implementation around the It's also the worth world. noting that the, when they restored the diaconate, they gave tremendous power to the bishops to determine how they wanted to do it mm -hmm. and how they wanted their Sorry. deacons formed and what kinds of people they wanted formed, whether or not you had a college degree. Some places do require that, some don't. Some do have strict rest restrictions on the numbers. I know there are some dioceses that don't want to have more deacons than priests, mm -hmm. so they keep a lid on it. But, but that's an interesting thing to note globally then. This, I mean, this really is a phenomenon of the, sort of the, the industrial nation church, yes? Mm -hmm. And these things, it's not that these things don't happen in other Catholic places around the world. It's just that they might have very, much more uh, well-formed lay people who do this, or at least much more empowered lay people who, who bring people together, conduct prayer services, who serve on the ground as they do in Latin America. Uh, we also have noted that in sometimes when we haven't had deacons, religious orders have filled in. So, I mean, what, who's doing these functions has been kind of handed around, and this is functioning here now, but it, it might look different in other places. Well, that's a good preview for our next segment, which will be on women deacons. I want to thank our four distinguished panelists today for talking to us about the diaconate, its history, and its present practice. For Fordham University's Center on Religion and Culture and America Media, I'm Father Jim Martin, and we'll see you next time.